Welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Becky Anderson. I'm so thrilled. One of our favorite authors is here. It's Melanie Benjamin, New York Times bestselling author of our new book, The Swans of Fifth Avenue. Melanie, it's so great to see you again and have you here with another book. We love it when you have a new book. Every time. Uh, I love coming to Anderson's. You guys are always my first stop. I know, and we yeah. so appreciate that because there are tons of fans here and we just love having you back. And this book especially is so incredibly wonderful. It's been out about six weeks. Yeah, six weeks now. Six weeks. The Swans of Fifth Avenue. So tell me, what are you hearing from your readers who have read your three previous historical novels oh. and maybe some new readers that are new to your writing? Yeah, there, I think there are definitely some new ones with this one. Um, because of the new setting in New York in the mm -hmm. 1950s and 60s, that super urban, glamorous New right. York kind of thing, there are certainly some new readers that I, I have encountered. Truman Capote fans, oh, uh, sure. people who are big fans of style blogs and style magazines, fashion, because of Babe Paley being in this. So that's kind of a newer um, audience, I think, for my book. Uh, yeah. and I, but I also think it still does appeal to people who liked my previous books. Yeah. Well, I think people are fascinated, just like when you think about all the Downton Abbey fans. You know, they yeah. want to look at high society and they want to see the backstory or, right. or the dirt of the gossip or whatever they want to see. Right. But I think knowing high society at this time is a little bit different than thinking of the Gilded Age or, well, yeah. or whatever. But thinking about what was high society and who were the tops? and the people that were the, the, the fashion icons, everything yeah. that went along with what, what made Manhattan at the time. Right, I mean, yeah. you know, that Mad Men, you know, certainly tapped into our fascination with that era, sure. and I think sure. this book definitely, again, feeds on that. But also, um, I think people do want a glimpse behind, you know, behind the Gilded Curtain, you know, sure. to see exactly. the reality. They kind of want to see that these people with these super privileged lives on the surface wasn't so rosy underneath. Right. Well, the book is was the number one indie next pick yes, for thank February. You all. Oh thank, my gosh, that thank was thank you, an, indie booksellers. Oh well, you know we love what you write, and that yeah. was an easy thing. I think there were so many people I've heard from a lot of colleagues around the country absolutely adored this yeah. book. Yeah. But it's gotten some great reviews, some starred reviews, mm -hmm. and everything. So. With all of this, tell us where the seeds started to grow for this one. I mean, what was yeah. it that made you want to tell the story of these women, this group of women, the swans, or the ladies that do lunch? The I guess. ladies who lunch, lunch right? the original ladies who lunch. And, and their relationship with Truman Capote. What an interesting story. Yeah, well, yeah. initially it was simply I had to write another book. You know, your editor goes, okay, great, you have a deadline, we need a new book. So I went to my bookshelves for inspiration, which I have done before. That's how yeah. I wrote The Aviator's Wife was okay. rereading a biography of Charles Lindbergh that I own. So I'm a huge reader still. This is like my office. I just go look at, for ideas. Yeah. And um, I came across the only book I owned written by Truman Capote, the book called Answered Prayers. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, Truman Capote I was most familiar with was the end of life, bloated, drug addicted Truman Capote who would show right. up on The Tonight Show. Sure, sure. Truman P Capote, the literary genius and writer I wasn't as familiar with. And so I, I picked up a book, this book one day, and I paged through it. And the story called La Cote Basque 1965, I, I remembered that it had been a great big fat literary scandal when that book mm -hmm. story was published. And that's really all I knew. But that was enough. I thought, oh, a literary scandal could be a juicy idea sure. for a book. That was all. That was all it took for me to go start starting to research this, googling it, and then coming across this really heartbreaking. I found um, kind of unconventional love affair between Truman Capote and Babe Paley, mm -hmm. the most beautiful woman, the most fashionable woman of her time, married to William S. Paley, and their relationship was truly heartbreaking. It lasted for 20 years and then he broke her heart right. as he broke all these beautiful women's hearts by dis by uh, betraying all their secrets right. in this short story right. resulting in him being banished from this world. Yeah, You know, it's so interesting that image like you said you saw on the Johnny Carson show mm. of Truman Capote but he there was a different image of him when the when he met these women right. in New York because he was the golden boy. He, he was. was this this author. I mean he was he really was this they loved him and well, they yeah yeah i mean yeah. they were on this one hand the pedestal they were the socialites of this mm -hmm. world the, the swans he called them the swans beautiful women gloria Van, uh, gloria vanderbilt was one of them gloria guinness some keith bay paley women who are fashion icons still today 
And um, Truman in 1955, which is when my book begins in 1955, Truman was someone to know. Yeah. He was the literary wunderkind. He'd already had a play running on Broadway. He already had, had his first book published. He was working on Breakfast at Tiffany's. And he was gorgeous, too, in those yeah. years. If you've ever but seen why? a photo yeah. of Truman oh, Young, yeah. I mean, he was as, just as fabulous a person as, as Babe Paley was in, her own, in his own way. And, okay. um, right. So, yeah, when they met, it really was kind of a, a serendipitous moment in time, but, you know, he was something then. Right. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned Gloria Vanderbilt because I sat next to her at lunch a few years ago oh, wow. in New York. She had a big, huge photobiography that came yeah, out about yeah, her. Yeah, yeah. You know, she's, of course, Anderson Cooper's Anderson mom. Cooper's you know. mother, yes. But yes. she, even at her age, and she's got it, she's in her 80s. She at is. Least. She's yes. in her, she was still rock solid posture she you know and just everything was perfectly oh, in place fabulous. and you're, you're sort of checking your clothes and going oh I'm so unworthy I feel like you know? a slouch next to <laughs> her right. right but even at her age and sitting next to her it was just incredible to talk to her but very down to earth really oh really interesting. Well, yeah. she's had a tragic life yes she has but I think yeah. that she is representative of right. these women right. babe and all of them and, and there are a lot of ways you you feel sorry for these women yeah being trapped in marriages perhaps that weren't beneficial to them except for wealth and beautiful clothes and the sadness of that life. Right. But yet I admire, again, that, that attention to the personal, the attention to fashion and, and deportment and always looking just beautiful and at your best. Right. And you're giving right. that to the world. It's a, it's a present. It's a gift. And right. I kind of long for those days because I think we're, we're way too casual these days. So how do you think, you know, when you think of the media back then, and I know the media would hound these women. Mm -hmm. They would walk out of a restaurant or whatever they were doing and the photographers were there and everything to capture mm -hmm. what they were wearing, who they were with, you know, yes. that sort of thing. Is it similar to what we do today on reality TV in any way when you think of, but I know it's a much different, it's different. class. It's the same but different. But it's different. I mean, they, they did cultivate yeah. the publicity. Right, right. They did. Like, mm -hmm. But unlike, I think, people today who allow the cameras into their lives in, in reality shows or constantly Instagramming their lives, you know, these women really tried to control the image and didn't want to show yeah. the mess. Yeah. And I think today people welcome the drama. I mean, if there was drama behind those closed doors, these women never wanted the world sure, to know right. that. It was all about the perfective, well, and then the perfect story, image. The story that was published in Esquire. Well, right. And then Truman out. did. Truman right. did show the mess. Right. Yeah. So tell us about these women, because some of these women, it's, and I went on and I looked online, I looked in Google, Google Images. These women mm -hmm. were gorgeous. Oh my gosh. Oh I mean, gosh. Vogue and Bizarre. And I mean, their fashion was just, they were the trendsetters. Well, and they were. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, Babe Paley was the first woman elected, first person elected to the International Best Dress Hall of Fame. And she started trends, uh, the trend of a woman's scarf tied around a handbag. Oh, yeah. She did that first. Yeah. And so, yes, they, they certainly, like Gloria Guinness, who was another one of these beautiful she, women. She was beautiful. I oh looked up her picture. Oh my gosh, gorgeous. Wow. Like one of the first yeah. people to wear Pucci. You know, she was champion of Pucci. And, um, you know, but her beginnings, as I, I describe in the book, were anything mm -hmm. but that. She came a long, long way. And that's what I found so interesting about all these women, that they were, they all kind of achieved the same level of fabulousness. Yeah. They all had such different beginnings, and very few of them were born to this world. Right. So many of them kind of had to find to climb their way to this world by marrying well, which was really the only option available to them then. But then also, too, you know, you, you talk in the book and some of the stuff that, that Babe went through with her own husband, mm. you know, putting on appearances, being perfect for him, right. having the drink and the appetizers and everything when he walked in the door right. at night and always looking absolutely stunning. That was her job. But, but what did she sacrifice? And I think well, of her own, I mean, her own pursuits, yeah. her own mind, her own, you know, Yeah, I, that's why I think Babe's yeah. the more tragic, the most yeah. tragic, heartbreaking figure of this because yeah. she had the most seemingly perfect life, married to William S. Paley, you know, the founder of CBS, certainly pots and pots and pots of money and private jets. Um, but the price she paid, her mother basically raised her and her sisters to marry this kind of man. Just their only avenue, the only, the reason for being was to marry well. And Babe, though, early on had a career at Harper's Bazaar as a, as a fashion editor. So I think she had a creative bent. I think she had a creative will, you know, a desire to do something, but yet could not escape her mother's handprints all mm. over her life, which is marry fabulously wealthy men, and she did. And the great sacrifice, of course, was she had no outlet other than her own appearance, 
I think she turned herself into a work of art. Oh yeah, in a like way. a canvas. Which a she canvas. Was yeah. yeah, and then making sure everything ran smoothly, and and making sure her husband's every whim was met. I mean, yeah. again, she was raised this way, mm -hmm. and you know, she first married well in the forties. You know, that was a different time. That was really the only uh, avenue open to her. But the price she paid internally right. for sublimating herself and for the pressure she felt, she always had to live this perfect life. She always had to look perfect. She never let her husband even ever see her without makeup on, wow. ever. So this, wow. that, that the pressure, pressure, the pressure, the pressure. And that's yeah. what drew her to Truman. And I think Truman to her is I think they both were completely vulnerable and broken and a mess inside and could never let the world see. So they found each they other found that each way. Other. They found each yes. other. Yes. So, so what, what drew the other swans to Truman, do you think? And, and, and tell us a little bit more about the relationship between Babe and Truman Capote. Well, I think initially he was the flavor of the month, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the next, the yeah, most signed sure. for their dinner parties. And, and truly that was what he was. But soon, I mean, Truman was an out and proud gay man in the 1950s, which wasn't an easy thing to do, but that allowed him into this circle. The, the husbands didn't worry about him. He wasn't going to sleep, right. he wasn't going to sleep sure. with their wives. So he was accepted from the husband's level. For the wives, he was a new best girlfriend in a way. He yeah. went shopping with them and he worshiped their beauty. He loved beauty. This is the thing about Truman. He never belittled their lives. He never took them for granted the way their husbands did. He appreciated everything they did to maintain this fabulous exterior. And he wasn't a threat because he wasn't another woman. Right. So I think that's the secret to how he kind he of became, became part of the group. And, part of and, the swans, yes, the right, group. Right. And he named them the swans. Yeah, that, right. That's what he called yeah. them. Uh, but uh, uh, Babe, though, again, was special. Babe did kind of confide everything in him, and he shared a lot with her. And their relationship seemed to have a dimension to it that the others didn't have. Mm -hmm. I mean. Given at any given point, Truman could say, I am your best friend, and I am your best friend, and you're my best friend in the world. He told them all that at several times because that was Truman, right? Yeah. But I truly think with Babe, he, she, he may have actually loved her <laughs> in a way that he, he, I mean, almost as much as he loved himself, let's say that. Right. Yeah. So, so why do you think he wrote this story? Yeah, that's you know, question, why did he write this story, and why would he jeopardize it? He changed the names of some, some, some of, of them, but, but not people all. could figure out who they were, right. pretty much. So, but some they did, some he didn't. So and what happened was, was yeah. in 1975, this happened. Mm -hmm. um, this is after In Cold Blood, when he found himself really unable to write anything for years and years after this amazing success. And I think he ran out of stories to tell. Yeah. And so he looked around and found the ones that were closest to him. Now, I, I tell everyone, if you want to know why I think you wrote this story, you need to read my book. Because I think that my book is the answer. But I think there are a lot of answers. It's not mm -hmm. so simplistic. It's not simply that he ran out of stories. There were other elements as well. Maybe he was testing their love. You know, maybe he truly didn't think they'd notice. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that they were, yeah. the yeah. names were changed, but situations were real, right. and perhaps he didn't really think they'd recognize themselves, which I can't believe he was that stupid. Sure. Um, but for whatever reason, he borrowed their stories for his, you know, and published this story, which he betrayed them all. And I think the book, to me, the book is about who owns our stories. Is it, we all have stories we tell ourselves, we, we have stories we tell other people, we have stories we tell other people about ourselves. Who owns these stories? Right. Is it the person who you're telling them to? Or is it you? I mean, I think the book is really examines sure. that. Sure. Yeah. And also how people use stories against each right. other. Right. Against know. each other yeah. and for right. each other. And, sure. Um, yeah. The, you know, uh, Truman, none of them, all of them had a very casual relationship with the truth, I think, uh. in a lot of different ways. I mean, all these women had something to hide. So, so was that hard know. when you were researching the novel to figure out what was truth from what? Oh, no, it was delight oh, to okay. know that they all had, at various points, okay. reinvented themselves many times and told different versions oh, of themselves over yeah, the years. Sure. That gave, they were all unreliable yeah. na narrators for yeah. me, which is a dream oh, yeah, for a novelist. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yes. So talking about the research, and I know you love research when you, in these novels that you've mm -hmm. done. Uh, tell us about what, where did you go? Did you talk to anyone who's still alive from no, this No, I never would do that. Okay, okay. Um, I'm not a stenographer to the past. <laughs> I'm not okay. a biographer. I'm mm -hmm. a novelist who has to invent. I also respect um, people who, you know, the children of these people mm -hmm. who are no longer with us. I respect their privacy. I would never, never want to borrow their stories from my own 
personal gain. I'm not Truman in that way. I'm not writing about anything that isn't already known. So no. Um, but yeah. I did a lot of research. I, I certainly read a lot of biographies, which is normally yeah, what I do. Right, right. But then I went to New York, you know, and I went to oh, the St. Regis and I got a <laughs> behind the scenes tours of the St. Regis because that's where Bill and Dave right. had a, a, an apartment. And, and I, I went to the library, New York Public Library, and looked at Truman's papers. And I just kind of played around in New York for a few days, yeah. and that was a lot of fun, too. So that must have been really wonderful. I mean, thinking about what it was like in the heyday, yeah. in the 50s and the yeah. 60s, what Manhattan was like. But, you know, you must have, there must be tons of photographs of all these women. Oh, I well, mean, the, yes. I mean, and thinking of all the newspaper articles that mm -hmm. were printed Vanity about Fair, them in magazines. Vanity Fair, Vanity yeah. Fair seems to rerun this story from a different perspective every couple, three years. Ah. So Vanity Fair, particularly, their archives were a treasure trove for me. Harper's Bazaar as well, The New Yorker as well. Yes, certainly there's a lot of um, ink spilt about this yeah. long before I started to write about it. So so what is still remaining of that time period that mm -hmm. the Swans, when they were in their heyday, what, like the restaurants, I mean, uh, well, hotels or even the apartment buildings where right. they lived, what is still left in that part well, of Manhattan? You know, the St. Regis is still sure, there and it's sure. still a beautiful resort. It's owned by some conglomerate now and it's yeah. like something, I don't know, I can't remember. It might be Omni or Weston, something like that. I can't remember. Uh, breakfast at or Tiffany's, obviously, is still yes, the same. Right? Bergdorf's. 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 The Plaza still remains. It's a little different, but it still remains. Right. Um, as far as restaurants, there is one called oh, La, Gren La Grenouille. Le Grenou. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it yeah. right. That it, it's not. It wasn't around then, but I think it's the closest restaurant in Manhattan to that time. I'm and I actually, my agent took me there for dinner. Oh, and it was nice. just lovely with the enormous floral arrangements on the tables, just like they had back then. The Twenty One Club is still there, sure. and that's very, you know, very reminiscent of it. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, the Coat Basque is no longer yeah. there. The Colony is no yeah. longer there. Um, Truman's apartment building, which was one UN Plaza, is still remains, and the Fifth Avenue building where Babe and Bill had a penthouse, two floors apartment, is still there, but I obviously couldn't get yeah. to see it. Oh, too bad, too <laughs> you bad, know. too bad. Yeah. You know, it's funny, because Bergdorf's, the mm -hmm. woman who's been one of the the style, oh, fashion type, um, Betty. Betty Harbrecht? Uh, yeah, Har Harbrecht. Yes, I read her book. Yes, yes. yes. Now, I would imagine that she she helped many of those she, women. She, I think in her book she wrote about the Babe Paley was one of her first customers oh, when she started working there. And that she, Babe was already very ill by then. Babe died of lung oh, cancer thanks, sir. only a year or two after this story came out. And she was already very ill, but very kind. I think yeah. she, she writes of not really knowing what to do. You know, it was, she was like her first personal client there. Oh, wow. And just wrote of how kind Babe was, yeah. which she was. Yeah. No one ever had a bad thing to say about Babe Paley. Yeah. So uh, you had a lot of cameos in the book, but, mm -hmm. but these people, they obviously ran into these people. It was, they did. It, was it? So, so it's interesting, the p people you put in, and, and because, but it's, it's, it's totally the truth, you know? Yes. So people like Lauren Bacall or Frank Sinatra, mm -hmm. or Andy Warhol, which is an interesting relationship with Truman Capote. Right, which from, we really don't go into in the book. Yeah, I know, but there is of, some interesting stuff about yes. him. But um, Rosemary, uh, Rose Kennedy, I right. mean. Rose Kennedy. But these were true sightings. I mean, these were, these, they ran in, they were in the same right. circles. Right, and especially when yeah. Truman threw the black yeah. and white ball. Which is kind of yes. the centerpiece of the book, right. and probably the, right. the, the the chapter I enjoyed writing the most. Yeah. And everyone was there, wow. you know. And Frank, writing from Frank Sinatra's perspective, perspective was so much fun. Oh. And now, like, I really want to write a novel about Frank Sinatra because that was just a lot of fun. Um, yeah, yeah, they were all part of that world, right. you know. Maybe not the core group of swans, you know, yeah. as, as he called them, but they certainly were on the outskirts of that yeah. world. So that black and white ball that, that Truman put on, was it was, it, was, it, it was in celebration of... Well, it, it was officially in honor of Mrs. Catherine Graham, Kay Graham, who um, owned the Washington the Post. Post. Her husband right. had committed suicide yeah. earlier in the year, and he thought she needed cheering up. It was really to celebrate in cold, cold blood. blood. Right. But he couldn't, even Truman, couldn't bring himself to throw a party for himself. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew that if, yeah. he, if, if he had thrown it in honor of any of the swans, Babe or Slim or Gloria, they all would have been jealous. So right. he thought he had to get, brilliantly, I think, he needed to bring in someone who wasn't quite of their world. But they all knew and respected sure. Kay Grahams, and she was Washington. So um, it was in honor of her. And it was in 1966 at the Plaza Hotel. 
And it really kind of is the pinnacle of the, the 50s and 60s. 60s. It all kind of goes downhill after that, Vietnam um, and, and Stonewall and, and then the 70s of New York with the crime and, and, and the darkness of it all. And Truman himself. Well, it sort down. of goes, goes down goes with down all down. that, so too. It's really right. kind of like the pinnacle of his life. Yeah. Things were never that beautiful right. again for right. any of them. Right. So was this book, I have a feeling it was really fun for you oh to write. Oh, Compared, yeah. I mean, not that the other ones weren't fun to write, but this one, I think, probably. It really was. I yeah. mean, prior to this, Mrs. Tom Thumb was my favorite book to write, yes. the most fun. Okay. I have to say, a Aviator's Wife, as well as it did, really was agonizing to write. <laughs> This book, yeah. oh, pure joy, pure yeah. joy, and it wrote itself very, very quickly. I just, um, it, you know, I've always had a fascination with New York anyway. I, I've always read The New Yorker, and I've always wanted to long to go there when I was younger, and I just never got a chance. And yeah. So I had that that kind of, you know, longing anyway, so this seemed to fulfill it. It really was fun. So, so was it easy to stop researching or looking things up about all the swans or Truman Capote? Or was it a point where, <laughs> oh, I just can't wait to start you know, writing I am this, very you know? self-disciplined yeah. about that. I think for some authors of historical fiction, that's a rabbit hole they can go down exactly. and they can come out of. Exactly. And some of them, I think that may be why they take a long time to write a book. They get very caught up in the research and never want to come out. I'm pretty disciplined. I figure, I mean, for some reason, I know when I've got what I need, mm -hmm. and then I just kind of push it away and then just start writing. Yeah. Um, but it, I still love to, to look at those old, you know, the, there are a lot of fashion blogs on the internet that really go into that kind of, oh, yeah. okay. um, the fashion of that time, time. and those are just beautiful. Oh, they were beautiful, yeah. and I love the, the cover for oh, the book. Oh, me too, yeah. me too. Yeah. I'm really pleased with yeah. it. Yeah, it's just gorgeous, yeah. it's just gorgeous. So who is your favorite swan altogether? You, you know, think? well, obviously Babe, I think, touched my heart sure. more than any of them, but as far as who I just want to spend some time with would be Slim Keith, okay. who um, Slim, Hawks Hayward Keith. She first married the director of Howard Hawks. She discovered Lauren Bacall. Um, they modeled Lauren Bacall's entire screen persona on Slim. Then she married the agent uh, Leland Hayward. Her good friend Pamela Churchill took Leland Hayward away from her. So then she married an English lord. But through it all, um, she had a really healthy appreciation of the extremities of, of the extremes of the kind of life yeah, she was sure. living. She understood it's a lot of fun and games, but it's not to be taken seriously. Uh, and I really, I liked her voice. I liked her attitude. It was really like no, you know, she was along for the ride, but she didn't take it her, herself sure. quite as seriously as some of the others did. So that makes, I think you could relate to that. A I did. Bit I really, yeah, sure. I think she probably sounds the most like me. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, that yeah. makes sense. That yeah. totally makes sense. So, you know, your author's note in the back of the book, you, you talk about, you know, you only read a little, some of Truman Capote's work, but then you read more of it. Right. So did you change your, your ideas or how you felt about him as a writer well, after you had read more? I, I really did. And reading In Cold Blood, for one right. example. Right. Yes. I, so that was a book that when I was a child, my mother wouldn't let me read. I think See, she I, had it. I read it. Yes, I know. We were all like not supposed yeah. to read it because it was supposed to be scary. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't find it scary. I, I found it a fascinating character study and, and extremely well written. Um, I, I really did respect Truman, and I learned that early in his career, up until In Cold Blood, mm -hmm. he was such a disciplined writer. You know, and that's not what you would expect from a Truman Capote. You know, he had such a reputation as being a gossip and, a, you know, in yeah. love with the celebrity, in love with the limelight, out partying all night, Studio 54 and all that. But to learn how, how very disciplined he was mm -hmm. in his career up until that point, I really related to that in a way because I think I'm a very disciplined writer and I really understood that, the way he would agonize over word choices. And then, yes, I, I read uh, Other Voices, Other Rooms, which I thought was just an amazing gothic southern novel, mm -hmm. and Breakfast, Breakfast at Tiffany's, which is yeah, so different from right. the movie. Oh, it's very I, different. I mean, yeah. yeah, so very different. And his short stories, The Grass Harp. Yeah, and, and uh, he's such a brilliant writer. All his portraits of celebrities of the time, oh, yeah. all these things he would do for The New Yorker and for other you know literary magazines, these pieces of celebrity profiles. Fascinating, no, yeah, so right. good. But but the thing is, it's so interesting. The two recent movies made mm. with with he, yeah. um, Capote, yeah, and they're very and negative. Infamous. They're very negative, I think, in some ways. They well, don't really show they, some of those other sides. They only concentrate on the period of yeah. writing in Cold Blood, right. when he did engage in some questionable behavior, mm -hmm. questionable mm -hmm. behavior. Yeah. Um, you know, really leading the the two killers on, thinking he saying he was going to help 
you know, so they would get a stay of execution so they wouldn't be executed and absolutely not doing that and really wanting it to happen so he could finish the book. Yeah. That was a, I, in my book, we don't go into that because that story's been told. Right, sure, sure. It's just kind of touched on. But I right. do think it changed him forever, uh, not for the better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are certainly aspects of his personality that are very difficult to understand. Right. But I always tried to understand his childhood, which was tragic. He had a terrible childhood, being abandoned by his parents, basically, and never accept, his mother could never accept his homosexuality. And so I always try to go back to the childhood, and there I was able to find some sympathy. Yeah, for him. yeah, because I think that's a part a lot of people don't realize right. or and know that, about. And yeah. that is in the book, where we do, we do understand his childhood right. more. And, and it really yeah. was, the, I think, maybe the most surprising thing I, I, under, I learned about him. Yeah. Okay. It's how tragic the okay. childhood was. Now, I mean, you always, what, what is your earliest memory of, of knowing that, yeah, I think I want to be a writer someday? <laughs> and do you remember? Remember that first piece? I don't know how you know, old you were. I was old. But was, I was very, very oh. old. I, I didn't want to be a writer. I wanted to be an actor. Oh. Well, there's that theater See, part. I wanted yeah. to be in the theater, yeah. and I wanted to go to New York yeah. and make my fortune. Um, it wasn't until I was almost 40 okay. when a friend of mine said, I always thought you'd be a writer. And she doesn't know why she said it. And I, you know, we're still friends today. She, can, she can't explain why she said it. But when she did... It, Something... Yeah, it yeah. was like in the movies when the light bulb goes off. Sure. I've always been a huge reader. Yeah. And I've always been a dreamer. And I've always wanted to live other lives other than my own. And it all kind of worked then. Yeah, right. And um, that's... I, so I... Yeah, I was a late, late bloomer. Okay. Well, geez, you haven't lost any time, right? No, yeah, no, no. That's good. <laughs> oh, that's, that's wonderful. So, you know, I know you were a columnist for a while. Then you wrote some... Gosh, but, was I? Yeah. So you remember things no, I no, 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 no. But I'm just... The, and, and your love of theater and oh. doing that. But how, how do... How do those experiences inform you as a writer now? Do you well, think, especially I, the theater? Part. Yeah, I am. Um, I've always been. I've always wanted to be anyone but myself, and so that was the theater thing early on. But it was also my love of reading early on too, because it is in the pages of books we're best able to escape and experience other lives. Right. So I think my choice now as a writer, where I'm writing historical fiction, so far often based on real people's lives, that's that longing to escape. Mm -hmm. That's me being much more interested in other people's lives, me wanting to pretend to be German Capote yeah. rather than just be myself. And that's where I think it all kind of goes yeah. into. And I think as the theater training helps me become these people on the page. Right. I yeah. really think okay. so. So what do you hope people, or readers, any readers, new readers to your <laughs> books, or, or your, you know, some of your fans will take away from The Swans of Fifth Avenue? What do you hope? For uh, don't trust a storyteller in your life. Ah. <laughs> Beware okay. of the storytellers okay. okay. in your lives. I think there's that. I think uh, be grateful for what you have. You know, that the, the life of the beautiful people, the rich and the famous, isn't what it's, it is, uh, we think it might be. But we're all human. You know, that's yeah. the thing. Even if you have a bazillion dollars in private yachts, you can still feel sympathy for these women and empathy for these sure. women because we're all human underneath, yeah. and we're always reinventing ourselves. Okay, this is the quiz. I think we did this oh, before. Oh, gosh, I don't okay. remember. Okay, okay these, are, these are all book-related, so right. it's lightning round. Whatever okay. comes to you right off the bat. Mm, okay. okay, I know you won some reading awards when you were young yes. at the library. Mm -hmm. So what was your favorite book as a child? Ballet Shoes by Noel Streetfield. Oh, great one. Yes. Okay, um, a book that changed your world? Gone with Wind. Okay, how about a book you faked reading? Uh, a Confederacy of Dunces. Oh, no, that's, that one I... Oh, and I've heard that once yeah. before. Yeah, I, I, I well, never read it. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> okay, how about a book you've been an evangelist for that you had to tell everyone to read? It? Oh, there's a book um, that came out last year called The Sun by Philip Meyer. Oh. The Sun, S-O-N. Um, historical fiction about Texas yeah. in the early years of the Republic, and I love that book, and I've told many yeah. people to read it. Yeah, that we book. have some readers here that absolutely adore I love that, it. too. Love it, love I do that, too. Okay, what's your favorite fashion magazine? I think it would have to be Harper's Bazaar. Okay. Yeah. And what about your favorite cocktail, considering Gin the swans? Gin tonic with a lemon, not a lime. Oh, okay. Okay, remember a book that when your sons were young that you loved to curl up and read together? Oh, gosh, this is such a, it's such a... Um, I know, it's hard to choose one. I know. Yeah. I, I have to say, I, the one I remember the most is a lot of Dr. Seuss, but um, I Love You Forever. I still cry yeah. when I read no, that. No, no, I know. Yeah, no, I no, 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 that, that. Doesn't, do of, <laughs> doesn't do a lot of people. And anything you're reading now that you really love? Oh, I just finished a book called, it just came out, called The Arrangement. 
I can't remember the author. I it, can't think. It's of about it MFA K Fisher, the novelist. Uh, not the, she's not a novelist. She's a food writer. And I, you know, I have never read anything by her, but I certainly knew who she was. And I read this novel. Oh, beautiful! I just finished it. Um, I just came back from my last leg of my book tour, and I, w I finished it on the plane. Oh, Loved yeah. it. Okay, I have to read that yes. one. I haven't read that one. Okay, hundred percent, A plus. Yay! All right. Well, Melanie, congratulations okay. on the Swans of Fifth Avenue. It was a pleasure yes, talking to same you. Same here, Becky. Always is. Fantastic conversation with New York Times best-selling author Melanie Benjamin and her new historical novel The Swans of Fifth Avenue. It's all about Truman Capote and the Swans in Manhattan in the 50s and 60s. Thanks for joining me on Authors Revealed. Music